Father, again, we stand in your presence by means of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, thankful for the privilege and the opportunity that's ours to feast upon your word. Lead and guide us every step of the way home, Lord. May the Holy Spirit take this time and use it to the glory of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for it's in his name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We've been studying together in the book of Ruth, uh, not particularly verse by verse, but section by section. We're now in uh, the fourth chapter, and uh, this may or may not be the conclusion of this study. I thought that perhaps it might be, but then the, uh, when I got ready to make the video, I wasn't really quite sure of that. So there may be a follow-up video on Ruth. Now, I'm going to assume that most of you have uh, have been here for much or all of, of our study through this book, this marvelous book. And I'd like to thank you for that. I'd like to, to take this time also to just look down on what we've seen, sort of a bird's-eye view at some of the lessons that we've learned or more particularly a, what I believe is the probably the single most important lesson. Now, there's several ways that people look at the scriptures. For example, I, I could tell you about some time that I once spent with an agnostic in my, in my town here. It's been several years back um, that uh, who, a guy who was convinced that man wrote the Bible, not God, in which he said that the Book of Ruth was about a uh, strolling country girl creeping slyly to bed with her cousin Boaz. But it was, he, 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 did, he did say that it was one of the best books in the Bible because it didn't have any murder or any rape in it. And that's, so that's one extreme. I believe this guy was, uh, he was kind of into Wicca, that sort of thing. He was, so he's at the, he's at the opposite end of the far end of the spectrum there. Of course, that's not true. We know that's not true. Uh, then there are those who believe that the Bible is God's inspired word, that God has sovereignly overseen the writing uh, not just the writing, but the translation and the versions of the scriptures, including maybe even the chapter divisions, which is what I believe. And that properly and carefully studied, it doesn't matter what translation you use, they all have the same message. If you study it properly and carefully, they all have the same message, which is a picture of a child of the devil deciding to become a child of God, which is the opposite extreme, and I believe neither of those. And uh, if you follow this channel for any length of time, you, you, you know that, uh, that, or that doesn't come as any surprise to you. And I'm sure that there are many who would agree with the latter. In fact, I know that there are. Then there's another view. There's another view, which is that Ruth is a picture of a child of God who became redeemed because she was always one of God's sheep, even though she was lost in Moab. She was one whom God had chosen to salvation, if I could put that word in quotes. And so she became born again when she proposed to Boaz, uh, and Boaz took her to be his wife, which I also have to reject based upon the picture that I've seen. Now that may come as a, a little bit of a shock to some of you. So I hope to clear that up in this video. So as we come to uh, near to the end of this study, I hope to be able to shed some light on this, telling you what I see in all this. And I don't, as usual, I don't ask or expect anybody to agree with me on any, any of this, none of this. We can believe that all of this really happened, that Ruth really existed, Boaz really existed, Naomi really existed. Uh, Elimelech and his two sons really existed. This really did happen, that it's a historical account that God put there in the Word of God from which we can gain spiritual lessons. That's a pretty straightforward approach. 
But there are Christians who are very serious in their commitment to the Lord, I believe, who make the assertion that what God expects us to see in this, first and foremost, above all else, is an individual coming to Christ and becoming a child of God. Whether they were once a goat, which became a sheep, or that they were always a sheep and they came to be redeemed, either way, they became saved. And again, I, I put that in quotes, and I don't think it's either. I don't think it's any of that. My argument has always been, and I pointed that out here as clearly as I know how to point it out, you and I are free to make any spiritual lesson we can from the text as long as it doesn't contradict any truth in the Word of God. You need to, to nail that fact down. You need to understand this is not a book or a message to those who do not belong to God. It's another important fact you need to consider. In fact, Scripture doesn't say anything to the non-believer except for judgment. This is a love book letter from God to us, His people. It is, on the other hand, a marvelous message of good news to those who already belong to Christ. The interesting thing about the book of Ruth is that there is no uh, uh, universal agreement on all the types. Every serious follower of the Lord is tremendously interested in the type seen in this book. And yet, if you scan the literature, there, there is, a, at least in my mind, at least, there's hardly any other passage of Scripture where there doesn't, there doesn't seem to be any solid conservative position as to what all of these types represent. Think with me, if you would, for a moment about the account of the prodigal son. Without any doubt, the majority of Christianity for many, many, many years has used the account of the prodigal son as a type of redemption. That there was one, there was this guy who was off in a far country, away from where he ought to be. And when he uh, comes to his senses, he then, by his own volition, by his own will, he goes to the Father, and he's now redeemed. And it's almost universally taken as a picture of salvation. Well, think about that for a moment. The Father doesn't appear to be the least interested in finding his lost son. Um, oh, he's thrilled when he comes back, when he comes home, but is that a picture of God, a loving Heavenly Father, going out and putting the lost sheep on his shoulder and bringing it back? Is there any blood sacrifice? How can the account of the prodigal son have anything to do with redemption? And, and yet, by far, the great majority of modern Christianity considers that to be one of the capstones of the salvation message. There, as here, as, as here with Ruth, you can make any type out of that that you want, but if you tell me that your type there in the account of the prodigal son is a lost soul who in his lost condition comes to his senses and, and comes back to God and repents and says he's sorry, and by virtue of that he's redeemed, and now he's headed for heaven, I'm going to say, wait a minute. Your proposal doesn't fit the Scriptures. Why do you believe? Because you're one of God's sheep. How could He come to His senses if He isn't a sheep? How could He come to the Father if no man can come unto Me except My Father, which is in heaven, forces Him? Where is any forcing in that account? You can't do that with that parable. Yet that is done almost universally. It is typical in modern Christianity not to compare Scripture with Scripture. I can be in numerous Bible studies where that someone you know would say to me, "Well, now wait a minute, Steve. You know, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved." You know, we need we need to get people saved. You don't believe that, Steve. You don't believe that, and I'd say, "I sure do. I believe that." The problem is you don't believe it. I don't have any problem with that verse. Believe on the Lord Jesus and thou shalt be saved. And they say, well, we don't either. And I say, I also don't have any problem with John 12 because you are not my sheep, you don't believe. 
and, and you have a problem with that because you're telling me in Acts what the verse means is, is that if they believe, they'll become a sheep. And in John 12, it says if they aren't a sheep, they can't believe. You got a problem. I don't have a problem. Why don't I have a problem? Because if that guy's a believer, it's because he's a sheep. I don't have any problem. My concept of that verse in Acts fits beautifully with my concept of the verse in John 12. But they don't want the, the verse in John 12. I was teaching a, a class in, in Albuquerque, New Mexico years ago. It was years ago. You know, I've virtually never seen it, a man so mad. He said, I, I thought we were coming here to have serious Bible study in the book of Ephesians. And, and what we did is come here to hear your ideas about God's sovereignty. And I'm, I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. Chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world, translated in the, into the heavens, given to the Son of His love. How do you approach these verses? And that's what I'm trying to say. You can't make an example that doesn't fit the Scriptures, and that's, and that's what you can't do with a prodigal son. Or Ruth. Dearly beloved, I've said this in numerous, numerous videos. Listen to me, please. No unredeemed person ever comes to Christ. Fact of the matter is you have a whole body of Scripture that says he can't do that. And people absolutely fail to realize who the prodigal son was. He was a son, okay? He was always his dad's son. He could have died in the far country. He would have died a son. There is a marvelous lesson of peace and wonder in that parable that is virtually overlooked. Well, our study here has been in the book of Ruth. What are all the types in the, in the book of Ruth? I don't know. I told you what I, I think they are. I told you what I saw in those types. Might not be what you see. But they cannot be viewed as types which contradict the whole of Scripture is what I've been trying to say. I just mentioned the, the, the parable of the prodigal son. And I pointed out to you that the application that is predominantly made today cannot be right. There's no blood sacrifice. There's no searching. There's no dragging back. It, it simply, folks, it simply doesn't fit the biblical concept of redemption. Well, what about the, the book of Ruth? There's no blood sacrifice in the book of Ruth. I believe I have every right to suggest it to anybody that this is not a picture of redemption at all. It's a picture of salvation. Yes, we read the word kinsman redeemer. That's true. You can't, you can't escape that fact. You can't deny that fact. But just because it mentions kinsman redeemer doesn't mean that Ruth is being redeemed at the, at the time in which she meets Boaz, if you get what I'm saying here. It's a picture of salvation. Now, let me. I've done this before. I've done this in numerous videos. I'll remind you again my position on this. Let me properly define the word salvation. Salvation in the Word of God is not redemption. Okay? Only redeemed people are saved. And when I say or write that a redeemed person may or may not be saved, people go ballistic. How are you saved? By believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. How are you redeemed? How are you redeemed? By Jesus Christ's death in your place. Nothing else. Not because you asked Him to. Not because you had anything to do with it. He, he just did that. And now you can believe that. And it, and, it, and it makes a tremendous difference in your life if you do. Or, you could not believe that and it won't make a tremendous difference in your life. Would you still be in heaven? Well, you can't handle this book seriously and suggest that any one of God's children will be in hell. Can't be done. To do that is to defile the finished work 
of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and turn your back on clear revelation of the Word of God. So it is redeemed people who can come to Christ, who can believe on Him, and when they do that, they are saved, they are delivered. That's what the word sozo means. They're delivered from the law, among other things. Well, they are anyway, but if they don't believe it, they may live under the law, and you can concern yourself about the threat of eternal judgment for the rest of your life. You can walk around with your head hanging down. You can be worried to death over it, okay? Which is a foolish thing to do. Unbelievable to me how many people have, have come to me and said, well, that's, that's, good, that's good preaching, Steve, but you, you don't have any idea what I've done. I have faced terrible payment for a sin I committed 20 years ago. Here are people carrying a load of sin that God's forgotten, people that are washed as white as snow who think they're still black as coal. If you don't believe this book, why even read it? So maybe, just maybe, this book is, is not a picture of redemption at all. Maybe it is, in fact, a picture of Ruth, who was one of God's redeemed children coming to Christ just as the prodigal son came back to his father. He was always a son. Ruth was always the daughter. We could conclude that the underlying theme here is that Ruth is redeemed, and therefore, and when was she redeemed? When she was in, back in Bethlehem? No. When she was in Moab? No. Our, she was redeemed when Christ died in her place. And how, how many times did that occur? It occurred one time. Once. And, and it will never occur again. Therefore, she comes to Christ because that's what redeemed people do. That's what they do. That's what God says. If you're my sheep, you can believe. If you're not my sheep, you cannot believe. Just as Isaiah wrote. And you, know, and you can argue all you want. You know, well, the Bible says, but they, they, Steve, they could have believed if they just wanted to. Now, I, folks, I'm going to pin my faith on this book. Those who are not God's sheep cannot hear, they cannot receive, they cannot believe. Those are all verses of Scripture. They are not my opinion. So I believe it fits the type. Ruth, a redeemed person who do doesn't know it yet, but because she is one of his sheep, she believes and she comes to Christ, Boaz, a picture of Christ. I think you can make that application from this book. But I also do not believe that making that application rules out any others. For example, we know that redeeming means paying a price. What does redemption mean? It means the paying of a price. There is the payment of a price in the book of Ruth. Uh, oh, oh, for um, to be sure, it's not a blood sacrifice, and that's a real problem to some people. As it was at one time with me. You know, we see no blood sacrifice, but it is a beautiful picture of the paying of a price. The question in my mind here has been, are we looking at redemption or salvation? And you have to make up your own mind about that, people. You, that's up to you to decide. I think we could spend months just talking about types here in Ruth one of God's redeemed people for whom Christ died. She doesn't know that He died for her, but neither did you for a while. But He did. He died for you before the foundation of the world. You were in God's plan before He created the heavens and the earth. Your name was written down before time began. You were always in God's plan, never out of His sight, never outside His care. But you didn't know that. How does that make you feel? Because that's what this book says. Paul was separated from his mother's womb, but didn't know it until he was over 50 years of age. In Galatians 4, verse 9, I read, But now, after that you have known God, or rather are known 
by or are known of God. That's, that's a very interesting phrase. How turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage. I mean, what a wonderful thing to realize that you were always His and there was a day you came to know that. Just like Ruth. Ruth. A beautiful picture of that. She's in Moab, a foreign country. She's away from the, uh, the house of God. She's away from the people of God. And she comes back and she's directed carefully, gently, lovingly to Christ because why? Because Christ wants her to become one of His? No, because she is one of His. Ruth, a beautiful picture of salvation in the sense of fellowship and union with Him. Not of the fact that, that she's going to be redeemed and become uh, one of His sheep. She's already that. That is what I see as I hover above these, these four chapters of Ruth. It is a beautiful picture of that. But is that the only picture? No. There's Orpah. And, you know, before you're quick to, to resign Orpah to the, to the fiery flames of hell here, I want to I just lay this out there for you to think about. We, we could have... We could have done the same thing with Paul. We have Ruth as a human who makes a good choice and Orpah as a human who makes a poor choice. And so God has given us a beautiful lesson of that. Boy, if you don't make the right choice, you're in real trouble. And because Ruth made the right choice, she winds up the wife of a very wealthy old man who's going to die long before she does and then she'll have all his money. So Ruth made a good choice. Now, now, you can make that type, but does that fit Scripture? And the answer is no, it doesn't. It, it doesn't. Ruth could not make a choice if she was not a sheep because those who are not sheep cannot believe, cannot receive, cannot hear, cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Folks, those are verses of Scripture. You can't do that. You've come up with a type that is anti-biblical. And let me tell you, it's the common type of Ruth and Orpah today. Yeah, one of them's a naughty girl, a naughty, naughty sinful girl who made a good decision. The other's a naughty sinful Moabite who uh, made a bad decision. And you see, it's all up to you. And so you hang a, this saying on the wall there, you know, in your church, decision determines destiny. And, you know, but then you have an impossible time in tagging it with a scriptural reference. You know, I freely admit that you can make that type, but you can't make it fit the Word of God. And, and I don't want spiritualizing that doesn't fit the Word of God. The book of Ruth is clearly not a type of people making the right or the wrong decision. Okay? So what is Orpah a type of? I don't know. I don't know. But I do believe there are people for whom Adam's transgression has been removed who are not God's sheep, but they are not condemned because of Adam, but because of their own fallen condition, not Adam's. And they at some point come to Christ and we don't know what happened to Orpah. Okay, we just don't know. And so there is a sense in which everybody in the story has been covered by something Christ did in having Adam's transgression removed. We see her as apparently an outside member of the family. You know, there's lots of those. God says all who are of Israel are not Israel. But He also says all those who are His will come to Him at some point in their life. God says all who are of Israel are not of, uh, of Israel. Uh, in fact, in Elijah's day, he had about 7,001, unless Elijah was one of the 7,000. I don't know, but that's a far cry from the multitude of Israelites. A mixed company went up out of Egypt, but many of them fell away. Well, Orpah and Ruth started up out of Moab. One of them fell away. There are great numbers, great numbers of people who believe that they're God's sheep, and they are those that 
they are they're faithful. They're faithful to the Lord. You know, when did we see you hungry? The uh, the they they asked, when did we see you naked? And the Lord said, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. And these are my brothers and sisters in Christ. People, listen to me. These are these are my this is my family here. He's talking to who are surprised to find out that they're God's people. So that's amazing. That's, you know, how do we know that, that God didn't bring Orpah around at a later time? How do we know that? We don't. That's just it. That's my point. We don't know. And then, but we know that there are those who aren't God's people and they're surprised to, to find out that they're not. They, th they thought they were and then they, they find out they were not. I think there are tremendous numbers of people who think they're members of the family of God and they're not. They're not brought to Christ by the Holy Spirit. And I believe Naomi, among other things, is a picture of the Holy Spirit. Surely she's a picture of Israel, the nation, the redeemed nation who comes back to the land of Palestine, but she's also a picture of the Holy Spirit directing Ruth to Boaz. What I wanted to do here is, well, what I wanted to do is conclude this study in, in reminding you that you can make many types here. You know, and I've had people email me saying, you know, I think this type fits or that type fits and, and, and you know, and, and you folks have heard me say what I think the types are, but that doesn't make it true. If you can pick scriptural holes in those types, I want to know about it because I don't want to do that. I'm not in any way saying all the types that I've suggested fit all of revealed scripture. What I can say is that I think they do. So I get calls and I get emails from people that say, well, what about this type? What about that type? And my comment to all of them is make any spiritual application that fits all the Word of God and it's fine with me. But to make the application that this is human responsibility is absolutely contrary to the revealed truth of this book. And I'm not interested in that. Okay, and that doesn't make me very popular, but that's my position, and I don't ask you to, anyone to agree with me on that. Look at the parables of the lost sheep, the, the lost coin, as well as the, par, the, the prodigal son. What about what Peter said, Peter's chapter 2? where he said that for you were as sheep going astray, but are now returned, returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Folks, you were always his. He's always loved you. He loves you with an undying love. He always will. He has nothing against you. When he's tested you, you shall come forth as gold. Our loving heavenly father guides and directs our step every way through our life. He's, he will never leave us nor forsake us. We are constantly on His mind. He's always looking out for you. You're providing for you the best for you. Even during those times when it seems like He's absent or that He's not. Look, I love you all. I truly do. I want to take a moment here to thank you all for, for following us through Ruth. I want to thank you for all of your love, your support, your prayers for this ministry, for the direction of this ministry, which means so much to me. And thank you for all of your kind, loving comments. Until next time, this is Steve. Thank you for watching.